this InspiredInsider.com interview, we talk with Bavin, who's founder of Magoosh. It's tough enough running a startup, getting it successful, getting it off the ground. He talks about some of the huge challenges when you lose a co-founder, a team member, and a friend to a health condition. That and much more with the challenges of Magoosh coming up now. Jeremy Weiss here. I'm the founder of InspiredInsider.com. I talk with inspirational entrepreneurs and leaders and how they overcome big challenges in life and business. So I was talking with Eric and Eric says, you need to talk to Bavin. And I told him, because I told him, I need, I like interviewing and we interview entrepreneurs about the tough times and how entrepreneurs get through those things. And so today Bavin's gonna talk to, to us about how we overcome huge personal and business cha challenges and you know about running a successful business in the midst of losing an integral team member, co-founder and friend. And a little bit about Bavin's background is he got a degree in economics and computer science from Duke. He's an MBA from Haas School of Business at UC Berkeley. He co-founded Magoosh, which hold your t-shirt up for a second so I can see it. Yeah. Co-founded Magoosh um, in 2009, Magusha is an online education company that helps students boost test scores for GRE, GMAT, and SAT. They have 13 employees going strong and have helped over 20,000 students. Bavin, thanks for being here. Yeah, absolutely. I appreciate it. And I like to include a fun fact about the, um, the guest, Bavin. And a fun fact is... He played on several national level ultimate frisbee teams. Is that true? Yeah, yeah. I've been playing in college from '99 to '03. We made uh, college nationals once at Duke, and then uh, played for I want to say ten years after that, and then was lucky enough to make nationals in the mixed division uh, seven of those years. So wow. uh, it was a, it was fun. That's amazing. So, but then many of us talk about the tough times and how we have things standing in our way. You know, anything, anywhere from personal issues to money to health issues. And the question is, how do we overcome some of these, what seems insurmountable obstacles? What was that day for you, that emotional day? Yeah, so my co-founder, Hansu, uh, we were classmates at the Haas School of Business, uh, getting our MBA programs from 2008 to 2010. Uh, we, we pursued Magoosh full-time after business school, and we were on that journey together. And in December of 2011, um, I was in Amherst, Massachusetts with my wife visiting her family and we were on our way to dinner and I have my phone with me at all times and, and I got an email from Hansu. Uh, and the email started with, uh, hey Bivin, uh, I've been diagnosed with a rare form of lung cancer. Uh, and then the email went on and that was, that was just crushing. And in the car on the way to the restaurant, uh, I didn't, didn't tell my wife, I, I didn't tell her parents, I was just just contemplating, I couldn't read on, I just couldn't understand how this could happen to him. So Hansu uh, was 33 at the time. He was very fit and active. He was a non-smoker. Um, he did everything right. Uh, I mean, he, was, he had just juice fasted. I mean, he was one of the healthiest people I knew. And so uh, stepping out of the car on the way to dinner, I, uh, as we approached the restaurant, I mentioned it to my wife and I said, hey, uh, Hansu, who she knew well, um, has been diagnosed with cancer. And, and then we, we talked about it briefly, um, had dinner. It was very surreal. I don't, I don't remember the dinner at all. Um, we got back. I, I tried to write an email. I probably spent an hour writing an email back to him because I just didn't know what to say. Um, yeah. And then that was, that was rough. Yeah. Do you remember when you first talked to him after hearing that, what did you discuss? Um, you know, it was, it was interesting because he always put Magoosh first. And so he was really optimistic about his prognosis. Uh, his brother was a surgeon at UCSF, and he knew he was going to get good treatment, and they were going to try some experimental stuff, and he knew he'd be able to go through the process a little more quickly than others may be able to just because of his contacts. And so instead of focusing on his cancer, we had actually just been through some meetings and scheduled some meetings with potential investors 
uh, Magoosh had raised a seed round of funding in uh, the spring of 2011, and now it's winter of 2011, and we were thinking about raising a little more money. And so we were in that process, and so that's what Hansu wanted to talk about. He was talking about the logistics of uh, passing off those investors to me because he was typically the one who handled them. He was the CEO of Magoosh, and I, I ran product. Yeah. So I want to get into obviously what happened um, after and how you can kind of navigate the business and um, you know Hans who's personal challenges but before we do I want to kind of go back to the beginning when you how did you first meet and how did you know that he, this is the guy I want to start a company with we met in uh, we met in the fall first year of business school uh, 2008 and we had another co-founder, Pejman, who, who had come to school with the idea for Magoosh, uh, a little different than what it is today. And Hansu, Pejman, and I had all worked on a project together. And Pejman really enjoyed sort of working with me and Hansu and invited us over, talked to us about Magoosh. And from that first day, Hansu was just so excited. He came to Berkeley knowing he wanted to be an entrepreneur, and it was infectious. And so I would say that was definitely something that uh, drew me to him. He was charismatic. He was fearless. He really believed that we could disrupt education. Um, and then more specifically, I noticed that he just started to move at a pace that made me uncomfortable. I wanted to settle into this idea. I wanted to plan. So did Pejman and Hansu just started talking to people about this like it was his. Um, but not, not in a way that offended Pejman at all. Just, you know, he wanted to move it forward. He knew that as an entrepreneur, you have to move fast. You have to get things done. You have to experiment. And so he started talking to... Um, friends, family, potential investors just saying, hey, we're working on something. It's going to be amazing. He started, uh, as soon as we had a prototype ready, um, started posting on forums and trying to get feedback. And then we were telling him to stop uh, because we were a little worried about and embarrassed of our product. But he just moved at a pace that made us uncomfortable. And I think uh, for me personally, that drew me to him, even though in the moment it was tough. So what did that product look early on that you were embarrassed about, but he was just like forging ahead? Do you remember? Yeah. Yeah. So before Magoosh is what it was today or what it is today, it was a crowdsourced test prep where people could upload their own questions and, and interact with it. Um, and so that product had three calls to action on the homepage, uh, one where people could ask a question which meant, um, we meant upload a question, but they thought it was a help desk. Uh, it was one where they could create a custom practice session right on the homepage because we figured more options are better. Uh, so it was, you know, it goes against all the rules of having one call to action, being really clear on your landing page. Um, and we learned early on that, um, you know, people don't want to take test prep courses or classes from other peers. They want to learn from experts. Mm -hmm. But we wouldn't have learned that if it weren't for Hansu just putting it out there and people telling us they didn't like it. Yeah. So he moved really fast. What was another thing that drew you to him as a, as a co-founder? Yeah, so not only did he move fast, I mean, somewhat related, he was, he was fearless. Um, in that he, from day one, knew that Magoosh could be really, really successful and help you know, hundreds of thousands or millions of students in making education more accessible. And so he was so bullish on the company that you know, anyone who talked to him wanted to be part of Magoosh. And I think there's that level of, sort of fearlessness and the positive attitude that just drew me to him because I thought, if I'm with this guy, if I'm with Hansu, we're gonna be successful. Do you remember anything else that made him fearless? Um, like him was, personally, you know him personally too. Was there anything else besides business? Um, it could be business or personal that you saw. This guy's fearless. Yeah, he was the first in, in all of our classes to be the uh, one to go up in front of everyone and talk. He was the first to just go to networking events and talk to everyone who he didn't even know. Um, he was just a, a guy in whether it was... Uh, personally or professionally who thrived on what I like to call living outside of his comfort zone. Yeah. If he had done it before, he was less not less interested in doing it again, but that just wasn't where he wanted to be. He wanted to constantly experiment with the new activities and and then he would debrief and say, okay, what did I learn from that? How can I get better? Yeah. It's interesting because I'm listening to Robert Greene, uh, his book about 50 Cent, and he said the, the main thing, if he boils it down, is was 
that makes him so great is his fearlessness. And so it's interesting that you say that about Hansu also. What's a story where you complimented each other? Yeah, uh, first, just talking about how we complement each other, Hansu, it, you know, tied to his fearlessness, was a visionary. So like I said, from day one, he knew that we were going to disrupt test prep, disrupt education. Um, he scared me because he, he came right out of the gate saying, you know, we are going to be the best uh, education provider out there. And I thought, wow, you're thinking really big. I, I don't even know how we're going to get our first customer. And so what I was great at is figuring that out, figuring out how are we going to get our first customer. I, was, I struggled to think big. Um, that was definitely something I was weak at. I wasn't the visionary that he was, but I was the executioner. I was the one who would get it done. Um, and I think that was a great compliment. Uh, even when it came to raising money, I didn't want to raise money because I was worried we'd take other people's money, we'd take investors' money, and then could we really get big enough? Mm. Um, that was my fear. And I said, you know, if we're small, if we're bootstrapping, we can do it on our own. I can see how we can grow incrementally. And Hansu just said that's not good enough we have something here that's really special and and when I say that's not good enough not from a personal standpoint but from just an impact standpoint he wanted to reach so many students that he said it's our duty to, to you know raise some funding to grow faster and and he said you know you may not know how to do it um, but you'll figure it out and you have so what were some of those execution points that you remember that were influential that you played a big role in with his vision and you actually seeing that and then executing. What were some of those big execution points? Yeah, I mean, after uh, we had raised money and we weren't necessarily sure exactly how we were going to market the product, I started experimenting with a handful of different tactics, whether it was forum posting or having our GRE experts starting to write blogs and a few other things. And, and I'll say that um, the reason I remember the blog specifically is because that's what started working. We started writing articles and we started to see a little bit of traffic. And I'm pretty quantitative and analytical and so I started looking in Google Analytics and I started to see what keywords are people using to find our blogs, to find our articles. And then based on those keywords, we would think of new articles to write where we could rank higher than our original article. And we just created this process that was really systematic write a bunch of articles, see what people are searching for, see where we rank. If we're ranking eighth or ninth and getting traffic, write a more targeted article, rank second, third, or fourth, and get yeah. more traffic. And we just repeated this again and again and again. And we went from that, um, I would say that April of 2011, to from about 500 monthly unique visitors to uh, that August or September to about 20,000 monthly unique visitors wow. just through that strategy. Wow. I mean, we, we had no idea how we were going to do it and that was one of those things that um, sort of, it was Hansu's vision of we'll figure it out and then I uh, Go figure, figure it out. Go figure it out. Yeah. Then. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> what else did you find that worked? Um, I mean, then we started compiling all of these blog posts into eBooks and curated them and we, we saw a lot of other sites I think uh, you know Kiss Metrics was one that was launching some ebooks and there were a few others and we thought we have all this great content we could create ebooks and then just make it easier for our customers to access this for free and then what we found is that people have started sharing those downloading them um, and just taking all of our blog content putting it in an ebook and giving it away as a PDF uh, it just created this viral content effectively and and you know I use viral loosely it's the test prep world there isn't that much sharing going on mm -hmm. um, but some of these ebooks just from the downloads alone have generated you know over the course of a year twenty thirty thousand dollars in revenue um, to our core product that's great now I know you said Hansu was just rearing to go you felt like he always wanted to be an entrepreneur. Were you ever at a crossroads, whether to go into, because you were in you know, business school, to go into corporate America or continue to work on the startup Magoosh? Yeah, I was. Um, before Magoosh, I was in consulting at Deloitte, and um, I came to business school with, with a guaranteed offer to go back. Oh. Um, and so I did have a bit of a safety net. Um, but that being said, um, I had to let them know uh, early into my second year, uh, am I going to go back? Um, so at first I said yes, because I thought, well, we ha hadn't made too much traction with Magoosh, and you know, there's a good chance that I might end up going back. 
Um, and then as we were approaching uh, graduation, you know, we still hadn't figured everything out. Um, we were doing a little better, but not even enough. You know, we hadn't been paying ourselves. We knew upon graduation we wouldn't be able to pay ourselves. And you know, we're basically at this crossroads of, you know, should should I go back and take my offer with Deloitte or should I continue on Magoosh? Um, and Deloitte would have not only been a nice consulting salary, but they also would have paid for business school if I went back. It's big. Um, yeah, it's it's non non trivial, um, and it, it was a struggle because I I still didn't know how Magush was going to succeed. I knew we had something, I just didn't know it. And, and there's no way I would have turned down that Deloitte offer without Hansu. Um, Hansu just you know instilled in me this uh, this thought that we will be successful, and he's like, as long as we're doing this together, we will be successful. And so I turned down the Deloitte offer. I let them know that even though I had accepted that um, I'm pursuing my own startup and they were very supportive um, and uh, we went for it. And at the time we still weren't really paying ourselves. And uh, that was that was rough, but it was Hansu's fearlessness, his vision and just his belief. And like I said, his attitude was infectious. Um, he had me drinking his, uh, that Kool-Aid. That's a hard decision to make at the time. What was that conversation like that, I wouldn't say convinced you, but made you realize to go with Magoosh? What, what was that conversation? Yeah, um, it was interesting because it was really closely tied to our fundraising conversation. Um, my, uh, and this is say summer, early fall of 2010. So I'd already graduated. Deloitte still thought I was going to go back to them. And um, Hansu wanted to pursue fundraising. He wanted to raise money from angel investors who had been bootstrapping to date um, and because he thought we could just blow it up. He, he started to see some potential. And this is before we'd figured out any of that blogging strategy. So he just started to see some potential. He saw that students were using Magoosh. Some of them were. And, and the ones who were were improving their scores significantly. And they were giving us rave feedback. And he, he said, we just we will figure it out. Um, so let's raise money and let's really just make an impact on you know tens or hundreds of thousands of students. And what I wanted to do is uh, bootstrap. And I said I, I don't want to take someone else's money. I'm, I'm scared. I don't know if we're going to figure it out. And you know then I'm going to feel bad that we took someone else's money. Um, and you know we can try bootstrapping for another month or two, and then I can go back to Deloitte if it doesn't work out. And, and he said that's just not an option. Uh, because we have a duty to uh, make an impact on the world. And at one point, I, I told him, as we were walking around campus on this long walk, I said, you know, if you believe so much in this, um, and I don't want to stand in your way, I will I'll step away from the company. Uh, you know, I will support you in any way you can, uh, I can, but you can uh, pursue fundraising, and you can make Magoosh as big as you want, but I, I'm just not that confident. And, and he told me that, there's, that's not an option. He's not going to do it without me. And he said, and there's no way that I'm letting you walk away. Uh, and he got me. He what got do you me. say to that? Uh, I, you don't say much. You say, okay. Uh, <laughs> and I mean, he was, you know, this was a three hour walk around campus between uh, career paths and fundraising and all of that. And mm -hmm. it was three hours where he just wore me down. Um, I don't know how he planned it, but he, he wore me down, figured it out, uh, and then I said, "Okay, we're gonna go raise money. We're gonna make this big." And then, you know, a few weeks later, I called Deloitte and said, "Hey, I'm not coming back." So, were you married at the time? Uh, yeah, I got okay. married in uh, December of 2009. So, winter break, uh, my second year of business school. So, the the real question is, what your wife had to say about this? Yeah, so my wife, I think she believed in me more than I did too. Um, she knew what a consulting life was like and knew I'd be on the road and mm -hmm. she thought we had something incredible. And she did. Yeah, and she was incredibly supportive and there's no way I could have done this without her. Uh, she's phenomenal and it's funny, I think the story of my life is just people believing in me more than I believe in myself, whether it was Hansu or my wife. Um, yeah, and I, I think I was lucky, I mean, very, very lucky to, to have her and, you know, she was working and we tried to keep our expenses low so that I could continue to go with, you know, no salary or a minimal salary, a few thousand a month. When you brought that option to her, okay, I could do this consulting or I could do the startup, what was her first reaction? What did she tell you? 
she said do you know do what's gonna make you feel good and she knew that the answer was not consulting so she started it with it that way and then she she really just uh encouraged me to pursue magouche yeah and i think if i had gone to her and said hey i'm interested in consulting she probably would have said don't do it um but Hansu had already wore me down so at that point uh you know it was great it was almost like they were tag teaming without yeah. even knowing it yeah I ask because a lot of people, you know, they're married and or they have a significant other and so that person plays a role. So I'm wondering how that kind of, you know, weaved into that. But it sounded like they were both conspiring against you. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I'm incredibly lucky. Yeah. Um, they were both uh, they were both encouraging me to pursue what, you know, uh, what was really going to make a difference in my life and in others' lives. Yeah. So but then now... After you heard the news, obviously December 2011 about the diagnosis, and that's just a really hard thing to swallow. What happens next in, with Magush in relation to that? Yeah, I come back from uh, vacation, the winter break, and um, you know it's it's scary. Hansu was the outward face of Magush. He was the one who you know talked to the press. He's the one who would do an interview like this. It wasn't me. Um, I was the day-to-day -day operations person. I managed the team uh, uh, that we had. Th I think we had three or four people at the time, and so I managed them. Um, and Hansu mentioned to me that you know I'm not going to be in the office starting in January. Um, you know he's taking care of himself, which which I understood. And so uh, it was a scary, scary time. Um, I was worried about him. I was worried about how the team would react. I was worried about our investors. He even he was the one who built the relationships with them. One really smart thing he did is he forced me to go to all of the investor meetings. Um, and I said, you know, why, why am I going? Uh, you can do this on your own. And he said, no, people have to see us as a team um, because that's how we're, you know, really special. Mm -hmm. And because he forced me to do that before, the investors all knew me. And so, you know, when Hansu was stepping away, uh, they actually felt okay with, you know, me running the, the show. And, you know, technically we still had full control and it it wasn't really up to them but that being said it's good to have their support it's good to have them on your side and so um hansu had sort of set it up so that i could sort of run magush um in his absence and, and i don't know if he had planned to sort of always have some redundancy because you never know what might happen but whatever he did it worked tremendously mm -hmm. so what kind of role did he play after he stepped away what was it like um, so he was, you know, our number one advisor, and I talked to him um, despite his, you know, treatment and whatnot. Um, weekly, we would go on weekly walks. So our office is in downtown Berkeley. He lived just a few blocks away, so I would meet up with him, and he said walks were good for him for his health. And mm -hmm. so we would walk for about an hour each week, and we would talk about Magush. We wouldn't talk about him. We wouldn't talk about his treatment because that's not what he was interested in talking about. Um, he was interested in talking about how are we going to make Magush work. At the time, um, we were running out of money. Um, you know, we had raised some seed funding, as I mentioned, in spring of 2011. We'd hired some employees. We tried some tactics. The blogging was working, but even then, we weren't cash flow positive. And so you see that bank account draining. Um, and I started to worry that we were going to run out of money by um, April or May of 2012, and this is in January. And so I relied heavily on Hansu, um, on his advice and his opinions. So, hey, what can we do to turn this around? Um, and so he, he was there for me, and it was, it was crazy to me that he's the one with cancer. He has you know, lung cancer, he's a non-smoker, he's fit, he's healthy, he's active. Um, he's the one fi uh, fighting something that should have never happened to him, yet he's supporting me because he knows that it's hard to run a company as a sole founder. Um, it just it didn't make sense, um, but that's the kind of guy he was. Um, he just he knew that I needed his support in order to function um, in terms of running the business and getting us out of this hole that we were in. And so he he sort of gave me his support, um, and I tried to give him as much as I could. But it was he didn't he kept telling me the only thing you can do for me, the best thing you can do for me, is make Magush successful. Don't do anything. If you don't do anything else, that's okay. Just make Magush successful. So when you try to turn the conversation on him and his health, he'd just tell you, he'd refocus it back on the business? Yeah, yeah, he had ways of doing that where he would say, oh, you know, I don't really like talking about my health right up front. Um, uh, so that way he could spend most of the time talking about Magoosh. 
Um, and, and I could see the excitement on his face when we were talking about Magoosh. And so I knew that, you know, this is, uh, this is what we should be talking about. What got him so excited about GRE Pro? <laughs> well, now, now you sound like me because I would say, yeah, it's just GRE Pro. But, <laughs> but to Hansu, it was disrupting all of education. You know, GRE Prep's the first step. Uh, then it's, you know, it's GRE GMAT, um, SAT, then we expand, AP test. Now we're talking about general education. Now we're talking about international education. Um, we're just making education more accessible. And that was how Hansu saw it. He didn't see it as GRE Prep. And I think that's why he was so excited. Um, he was on the board of a nonprofit, an education nonprofit, before coming to business school called World Savvy. Mm-hmm. Um, and he was so passionate about education, and he he just viewed Magoosh as sort of stepping one step at a time. And and like I said, I was the executioner. I would think of the first step, but he could see ten steps ahead. Mm-hmm. So what did he see, and what do you see as the ultimate? What's the ultimate for Magoosh? Yeah, the I think the ultimate is really providing everyone with a convenient, effective, and enjoyable way to study. And what that means concretely is. I mean, almost replacing a personal tutor uh, across the board for any subject. Personal tutors are very expensive. Um, they can run anywhere from, you know, at the low end, maybe $25, $30 an hour, up to $200 an hour. And we want to provide something that's just stronger, more effective, um, but costs the same as maybe one or two hours of personal tutoring. And so students don't need a personal tutor anymore. They can just pull out their phone, watch a video on Magoosh, answer some questions on Magoosh, um, and learn what they need to learn. Yeah. So you were going on these, you know, having the monthly phone calls, you had these walks. What happened two weeks before um, he passed away? Yeah, so <clears throat> it's... It had been a long journey. Um, you know, it was January 2012 where he stopped working. We did our walks. We did the monthly phone calls after that. And then he'd moved to San Francisco. We lost touch a bit. Um, he had complications. He was in the hospital. I was scared. Uh, and then in January of 2013, I get an email from his fiance and him saying things are okay. We're back home. He's resting. He had a really rough few months, but he's doing a little better. And I was really excited. And so um, I, I asked for a bit of his time on the phone. Um, and I said I'd meet him in person, but he preferred a, a phone call. And so um, I had some company business to take care of. And I also just wanted to talk to him. And so uh, two weeks before he passed, we talked for an hour. And we primarily talked about Magoosh. And we took care of some loose ends that we needed to take care of. Uh, and more importantly, uh, I was able to tell him in that conversation about his impact on me and on Magoosh. There were certain things that he instilled in our company um, that I found to be amazing, and there are things that I ask other founders to put into their companies at a very early stage. Examples are we have a daily stand-up meeting at 11 o'clock where everyone talks about uh, what they accomplished in the last 24 hours, next 24 hours, and any obstacles. This meeting, even with 13 people, only takes five minutes a day. Hmm. but it, we just go really fast, but it keeps everyone on the same page and it keeps our, a really good rhythm. Um, he, he instituted one-on-ones for every manager to have a one-on-one weekly with their employees. And we were in a situation where at one point, um, you know, after Hansu had stopped working, we had almost uh, lost a key employee. But because we had these one-on-ones, I was able to uh, talk to them about three to four months before they planned on leaving. And we're able, I was able to find out exactly why they were going to leave and uh, rearrange their job, make another hire, do a few things that kept them there. Um, and that was all because we had these one-on-ones that Hansu had set up. And then the third thing I tell very, you know, early stage companies, late stage companies, wherever they're at, is to think um, about culture intentionally. And what culture meant to Hansu wasn't you know, hey, let's play foosball, even though we do. It wasn't, hey, let's go out and have a drink. For you, it ultimate was, frisbee. Yeah, yeah, exactly. Not, not, not a cult. Not, <laughs> but culture was um, defining our company in a way where you can decide, make a decision between two good things. So you have two potentially good options. Do I move quickly and just get something done, even though it may not be the best? Or do I take a little more time and make it the best? 
and our culture was, you know, done is better than perfect, and so we get things done. And it was Hansu who really focused on, hey, we need to define our culture so that when we're not around or you know people need to make decisions on their own, they have guiding principles to look to. And that's one thing I think is critical for a lot of startups. That a mistake they make actually is you know thinking about culture as ultimate frisbee or foosball or something like that. When in reality, culture is a sort of a decision-making framework. How transparent are you? How quickly do you move? How much do you serve the customer versus focusing on profit? Things like that. Yeah. So the other thing I want to ask about that, um, but I don't want to skip over what you said about the stand-up meeting because that's really interesting. What's almost something that came out of the stand-up meeting that almost surprises you looking back? One of the stand-up meetings. Yeah, well, they happen every day. And I right. think um, what's interesting is um, a lot of our team, now that we're 13, um, they don't talk to each other every day because they're in their own sort of area, whether it's marketing or product, and there's no occasion for them to talk to each other. The stand-up meeting is that one opportunity where everyone can share victories. And so we have one uh, person on our team, our GMAT expert, who anytime something good happens, he does this little happy dance. And it's one of those things that like now, even when someone not in his sphere of, of uh, knowledge or not on the content team uh, shares a victory, we can get him to do a happy dance. And it's one of those things that just you know wouldn't happen if we didn't have this daily stand-up and it brings some joy to the team and it gives an opportunity for people to celebrate wins together um, you know, before we get back to the grind. And the other thing I want to ask before moving on is you got a key employee to stay on. And how did you know to, oh, I'm going to keep this person on, or maybe it is better that they, if they want to leave, that maybe they should leave? How did you know that? Oh, well, <laughs> this person was, um, you know, this is after Hansu had left uh, or stepped away. Um, and this person had just been instrumental in picking up the pieces. Uh, they, they were a safety net for you know almost everyone in the company. Anytime something slipped, they would take care of it. Yeah. And I have to say that was something that was incredibly valuable. But also, they never really talked about the fact that they took care of it. And so, uh, it was just amazing to me, you know, what they were able to accomplish despite being, you know, fairly young and an early employee. And so, to me, it was a no-brainer. We had to keep this person on. And so, what I did, an exercise I went through with the help of Hansu is asking them to write their own job description, write what they did currently that they wanted to keep doing, write what they did currently that they no longer wanted to do, and write what they um, didn't do today but wanted to do, and then also what salary they would want. And one thing that's really interesting is you know, the salary, we weren't that far off on salary. That wasn't the big issue. It was more that they had picked up so many tasks in Hansu's absence that they didn't really enjoy um, that that was you know, making them unhappy and disengaged from their job. Um, and when we were able to get that on paper and talk about it, we realized, hey, you know what? Actually, now that you know, Hansu has stepped away, we should hire somebody in a role to take these tasks off your plate so you can focus on the things you enjoy. And now that person's you know, been with us for you know, two and a half years. How did you know that they were thinking about that, leaving even? It was that one-on-one -on -one that you know, Hansu had us set up. Um, during the one-on-one, -on -one, he always uh, told me to ask, you know, is there anything that's an obstacle for you in your work or anything that's causing you to not be happy? Hmm. And just by asking that question and opening the floor for that employee, they were able to share. Yeah, actually, uh, I'm thinking about, you know, leaving in, in a few months. I think it's just time for me to move on. Hmm. Um, and that's interesting because they didn't realize until I made them do the exercise of writing their own job description of why they wanted to move on. Got it. Yeah. So you get this, it seems like good news that he's doing better. What happens next? Yeah. So um, we have that conversation. Uh, I think it's in, in February and it sounds like he's doing better. And then I don't hear from him for a week and I'd send him some docs that he had to sign. And, you know, I, uh, I think they come back with a signature, but they were emailed to me from his fiance. So I still don't hear anything. And then um, you know, on uh, a Tuesday morning, uh, I think it was March 19th, I, I got a call from his fiance and she was in tears and you know, said that Hansu had passed away um, the, the night before. 
Mm. Um, and that was, uh, it was surreal, it was shocking. I was, I was actually, I live in Berkeley, I was in San Francisco, um, headed to uh, a conference, and I, I didn't know what to do. Um, I you know, called my wife, told her, and then I called uh, a really close friend of mine, and Hans, who's from business school, um, who was also an entrepreneur, and he lived in San Francisco, and he and I met up for coffee, and we talked about Hansu for about an hour, hour and a half. Um, and then I just went into the conference and I, because I didn't know what else to do. And I just sort of absorbed everything that was going on and, yeah. and didn't really think about it. And, and then when I came home is when I started the grieving process and talking to my wife and calling friends and, and whatnot. Um, but it was, uh, it was a rough time. It was really rough. Yeah, I'm sorry to hear that. Yeah. There's nothing you can do, I mean, except for move forward like you did in, in a positive way, which we'll, we'll talk about some of the things that you did to kind of just leave that legacy for him and the company. Um, what was a hard decision recently that you had to make and you thought of Hansu that helped you? Yeah, you know, Hansu, like I said, was the visionary. And, and one thing that, um, you know, I've thought about is should we just focus on GRE? So you, you know, earlier you talked about us being a GRE prep company, which we are, um, along with a few other tests. And and I thought, wow, we could do really well in GRE. We could just stay here. We could focus. We could be profitable. Be a nice little niche to carve out for ourselves. And then I thought about Hansu, and I thought about how really his whole vision for this and his level of confidence in us was about impacting the world's education. So how can we just focus on GRE? Because then we're not going to impact the you know the world. Right. And so that's when we started to get a, a a little more aggressive about marketing our GMAT product, marketing our SAT product, looking to expand into new exams. Mm -hmm. Started making a, a placing a few bets and spending money on areas that, you know, I my cautious self wouldn't have necessarily spent on, but I just was trusting that, you know, the the Hansu view of the world, which was, hey, we'll figure it out. Just you know or then you'll figure it out, just have a little faith. And so started stepping forward. And now we've seen, you know, great growth with our GMAT product. And we're starting to see a slight uptick in our SAT product, which is almost you know, effectively brand new. Um, and we're starting to hire out for other other products. And I think that I couldn't have done that without Hansu. And you, you mentioned faith. You start to have faith. And before it was more you were kind of balancing his vision faith. And you were like, well, how are we going to do that next step and being... I don't want to say the naysayer, but kind of... His, no, I was the, I was yeah, the naysayer. The, what, what was one of those conversations you now have in your head that you're on one shoulder, you know, you're the naysayer, on the other shoulder, you're the visionary but thinking of Han Su? Yeah, um, so we're, we're thinking about releasing a new product, um, not, not just a new exam, but a new type of product. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't want to share too much about that right now, but it's, it's a little more technically challenging than what we typically do. Mm -hmm. Um, and I can see a lot of reasons to not do it, and that's that's me. That's me saying technically it's going to be challenging. Um, it's going to require a lot of maintenance. Um, you know, it, but then there's Hansu who says, "Well, look at the impact this could have, and you know, we'll figure it out. But it could have a huge impact, and we could reach you know uh, hundreds of thousands of people." And so now I have this conversation in my head, and it's it's like ping pong where I, I'm thinking about why we shouldn't do it. And then I'm thinking about, well, if we do it, we'll probably figure it out. Um, and I, I mean, that's one example. But this happens in my daily work where I, uh, I sort of channel him and channel his vision and his sort of belief that things will work out. Mm -hmm. um, and so, yeah, that, that's a recent example. So, but then what's been a proud moment, like a celebratory moment recently after all this is, has happened? Yeah, we so last month, um, August, we had our best sales month to date. We've been growing, uh, I'm going to say, for the last few months, 20 to 40% month oh. over month. Um, so, you know, the, the company's really turned around. And, and I reflect, actually, on the fact that uh, Hansu's fiance had sent me a letter after he had passed that he had written in April of 2012 when we were still worried we were going to run out of money mm -hmm. um, that said, Bivin... Um, you know, I know the last few months have been hard. I know you're worried about running out of money. I just want you to continue to pursue Magoosh because I know you'll turn the corner. 
Um, I know we can make this, you know, a successful, profitable business. Um, and then he also uh, said something to me, which uh, you know really resonated, um, it, which was, you know, you 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 don't believe in yourself enough because um, your good is great and your great is the best I, I've ever seen. And that's what he wrote to me. Oh. Um, and you know, I uh, he he just sort of said to me, you you know, in that letter, um, what I took away from it is I just I have to try harder. Sometimes I'm scared to to try um but when i try um i've been lucky enough to not fail that often and i think hansu saw that in me um and so uh now we're celebrating you know our best revenue month ever um and i think about him and i think about how there's no way we would be where we are without him yeah yeah that's that's amazing how do you feel hansu's legacy lives on the business today besides your inner thoughts yeah, uh, I talked earlier about being intentional with culture. Mm -hmm. So we have uh, about 10 cultural values, and, and I think one of the ones we embrace the most is uh, sort of done is better than perfect. And that was always Hansu, uh, just putting things out there. This goes back to that first example of he put that site on those forums because uh, it was done. Yeah. And he uh, people today embrace that value in so many different ways where we'll you know put up an iTunes podcast where our uh, little thumbnail image isn't the right dimensions and it's 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 squeezed um, but it would have taken I've done little, that yeah, yeah. And, and rather than us you know yeah. my, my inner self says oh it's 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 not the right dimensions but we think back done is better than perfect we get it out there if no one's downloading the podcast then it doesn't even matter um, and another core value that really represents Hansu is challenge is greater than comfort. And this goes back to him living outside his comfort zone. He always put himself in positions where he could learn something new and where he could test himself. And so that's something we've instilled in, in the company and people look for an opportunity to challenge themselves and to do something new on a regular basis. Yeah. What's another piece of advice that you've gotten from someone that you still think back on? Yeah, I mean, so, similar to Hansu, uh, one of my best friends from when I was growing up uh, always told me I needed to pursue my own venture, yeah. and I was I was a risk averse kind of guy, so it was, it was a little scary. And and you know, he and what my friend said to me, um, which is not too different from what Hansu said to me, which is you're uh, you don't fail much, but you're scared to try, and so that really resonated with me because it was this idea that yeah i am scared to try and when i try things i you know i typically find a way to make them work mm -hmm. um and that's i think why i'm a good sort of execution oriented person um but i am scared to try and so that was the whole reason i continued pursuing magoosh um you know along with hansu being by my side is reflecting on the thoughts of, of one of my best friends who, who had told me years ago that you need to do this, you need to try it because you'll, you probably won't fail. Yeah. So what's, you know, the audience is, you've been through a lot with your co-founder, friend, the company. What's something you tell the audience to do right now if they're going through some kind of personal challenge or business challenge? Yeah. I mean, I think the first thing is just making sure you talk to somebody about it, that you have a support network. Um, and I would talk to my wife, uh, and I would talk to uh, other entrepreneurs who also knew Hansu, who we were classmates with. And I had an incredible support network. So while you're going through that um, challenge, I think uh, entrepreneurs want to put on this face and this exterior that everything's okay. And, and it's not. It, it rarely is. And I think it's really important to have someone in your life or multiple people in your life who you can talk to and you can be open with and honest with and let them know that you might run out of money or you're facing this really difficult decision or, you know, in my case, knowing that my co-founder had stepped away because he had cancer. Um, but just having a support network and people who you're really close to. Um, that's the first thing I'd ask, you know, people to do is just be open and honest with someone else. How do you even do that? Because obviously some people say, well, you have to have an open company culture. How do you know what things to share with the company and what things to just have a couple confidants that you talk to about these things? 
Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. So I'd say the first thing is you should definitely have confidants who are not in your company. Uh, and, and you should be completely open with them. And the, the way I found this manifesting is having a two-way relationship. So I have a friend from business school who runs another startup and we talk for 15 minutes at, every day hmm. on my walk home. And we talk about, hey, is there, or sometimes it's five minutes. And it's just, did anything happen today? Anything you need to talk about? And now we know each other's companies inside and out. And so we have someone to go to. Sometimes when you can't share something with the company, you have someone else to go to. So that's the first thing. Everyone should find someone like that. And it takes a while. It takes a while to build that relationship. So, but it's, it's well worth it. The second thing is you have to decide from a cultural standpoint how open you want your, to be with your company. And, you know, I know there's a lot of companies out there now that say, oh, you should be completely transparent with your company. So we're pretty open with our company, but I don't think that's right for everybody. And I think you just have to be intentional about your culture. You shouldn't share some things with some people and not with other people within your company because you're mm-hmm. going to form clicks and whatnot. Be intentional. So either you know, keep things private if you need to keep them private or be open if, if that makes sense for your company. But definitely have these confidants who you can talk to, you can go through to with problems. Yeah, I mean, the reason I ask is because I talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and a lot of entrepreneurs go through the situation of, you know, funds are running low that month or for whatever reason, maybe, you know, there's a 30 day payment coming in. It hasn't come in yet. And so payroll is tough. You, on one hand, you want to share with the company. On the other hand, you don't want to get people concerned that they need to start looking for another job. How do you navigate that? Yeah. So I think the best way to navigate that is to think ahead as a founder and notice maybe three or four months ahead that things aren't looking so great and start talking to people then. So we were in a situation where I was worried we were going to run out of money. We're in um, you know, February and I actually started telling our team that, hey, I'm worried about this and we weren't going to run out of money until say May or uh, June even. And I, I let them know that we're at risk and we're going to try to make some changes, but you know, no one's getting laid off. Um, we had a few people on our team, uh, our content experts, our GRE and GMAT expert, who could work part-time as tutors because that's what they were doing before Magoosh. And so I'd given them a heads up sort of a month in advance that, hey, can you find some part-time work for the next month? Um, because I, I think I might need you to go part-time. Um, but I gave them a month notice and I sort of looked ahead. And a lot of that was Hansu just saying, you know, you've got to keep thinking about the business and get out of the weeds. You have to think about the business at, at a higher level. Um, and I think when you can start talking to people sort of early on about the conversation, it becomes less about, oh, we're going to shut down tomorrow and getting them really worried and more about, hey, we have a plan in place mm-hmm. and we're not sure how it's going to play out, but just, you know, let's just follow the plan and see how it goes. Got it. Yeah, that's good to know. So what are some of the tools and systems you use for the business? Yeah, I mean, on a, on a daily basis, our entire team uses Asana, which is basically a shared to-do list slash project management list. Um, it's great for letting everyone see what everyone else is working on, letting people comment on different tasks. So we love that. Zendesk we use for customer service. Um, one part of our service is the fact that anytime a student gets stuck on a given question or with our product, they can email in and get that personal tutor-like experience. And we respond to them typically within a few hours. And so Zendesk helps us manage that um, queue. We get, I want to say, about 80 emails a day asking about not technical issues, but I don't understand how you did this problem. Um, and we respond to all of them, and uh, we track our satisfaction. I think we average 97 98% satisfaction through Zendesk, so it's something we're really happy about. We use a system called Intercom, um, intercom.io. It basically uh, helps you message to students or anyone using your web application based on triggers. So if someone in their profile says they have an Android phone, we send them a pop-up in our, our app saying, hey, we have an Android app in case you want to study on the go instead of using the web. Um, so Intercom is another great one. Um, and then from a marketing standpoint, we use SEO Moz on a daily basis, which basically helps you track all of your marketing campaigns. That blogging that I talked about earlier figuring out what articles to write. Even now, two years later, we're already in our traffic. It was 10x to what it was before. Um, we still use SEO Moz and still use that same strategy to continue growing our traffic. Yeah. What about personally? What habits or things do you do? Yeah, so uh, 
I'd say the number one you thing smile I do at is, this one. yeah I mean the number one thing I do is uh, we'll get married that's my advice because uh, <laughs> uh, so I sleep. I sleep I don't think I've heard that that one uh, said get married yeah uh, so the reason I say it your uh, wife will like to, to hear yeah, that no, no, yeah. she's, she's fantastic uh, I say it because since sort of living in, under the same roof as her um, I've never felt better um, because I get enough sleep. I get seven and a half hours a night. Um, if if it were just me, I would stay up working on Magoosh till 3 or 4 a.m. But because of her, I go to bed at 11.30 or, or midnight, and I wake up, it's, you know, say 7, 7.30, um, and it makes me so much more productive. And, and you think, you know, uh, all of us entrepreneurs, we think we're being productive between the hours of, uh, you know, 1 and 3. But in reality... Uh, we're going to be so much more productive if you get a good night's sleep the next day. Um, and I, I definitely have fallen prey to that. When she's out of town, I, I fall off my rhythm, and I'm just waiting for her to come back so that I can get on a regular rhythm and feel good about myself. Um, I can relate to you with that. What does she do to coax you into stepping away from the computer, though? Because I'm sure sometimes you have, like, one hand on the keyboard, and, and she's prompting you. <laughs> Yeah, uh, well, it's interesting. So early on, she would just announce that she's going to sleep. Um, and that didn't work because I wasn't always ready. So we've gotten into this rhythm where I tell her, I need to know 10 minutes before you go to bed. So 10 minutes before she's going to sleep, she says, I'm going to sleep in 10 minutes. And now I have time to wind down whatever I'm doing. And I know it's, it's sort of binary. I either go to sleep with her, or if I don't go to sleep, I end up staying up for another four hours yeah. so I have to go to bed with her uh, and so she gives me the 10 minute warning and now I'm like all right I gotta wind down as soon as I finish my task I just turn off my computer that way I'm not wrapped up in something that I need to be finishing while she's uh, she's in bed yes I can relate big time with that but then so I have one last question for you that I've been wondering but before I ask it can you tell us a little bit more about what's exciting now? Tell us about more about Magoosh and then also about the fellowship. Yeah. Um, so from a Magoosh standpoint, we talked a lot about GRE. Um, we're also doing GMAT and SAT. Well, we're making progress there. And you know, I think we're at the point where nearly uh, 3% of people who take the GRE are paying for Magoosh, and that's super exciting for us. And we're seeing impact every day from students who've taken the GRE, submitting a survey, talking to us about how much Magoosh has helped them. Um, we just released uh, a flashcard app last uh, month. Cool. Um, and that app in the first month has uh, you know been downloaded, um, let's say, 10 or 15,000 times and has nearly a five-star rating in both the Android and iOS stores with over 100 ratings in each store. So that's something we're really happy with because you know, uh, just released it a month ago and it's already sort of taken off on its own. And it's, um, I think one thing we find interesting is every day the flashcards are flipped, I think 300,000 times. It's just like, wow, there's you know, that many flips of our flashcards on a daily basis. So um, how um, are the flashcards for all the tests or is it only specific tests? So right now it's just for GRE. Uh, we're planning on, actually we have SAT ones out. Um, we just released those I think last week. Uh, what's really interesting about the flashcards are um, you know, the words are curated by our expert. So we know these words are GRE-like words. They're not just, it's not just some person throwing words in an app saying, hey, these are GRE words. We've custom written every sentence um, to be a GRE-like sentence in a lot of cases. And then the flashcards are adaptive. So as you miss words, they pop up randomly hmm. uh, through your deck, and they uh, pop up less and less often as you get them right each subsequent time. And so because of that, it sort of follows this idea of spaced repetition, which is supposed to help students learn from flashcards better. Uh, and I think that's sort of the main feature that people love, because it's not just going through a deck. It's telling you, oh, you don't know this word? We're going to show it to you again and again and again until you really do know it. Nice. What about the uh, fellowship? Yeah, so one thing we did um, after Hansu's passing was set up a fellowship. And so the fellowship is uh, to help uh, MBA students pursue their entrepreneurial venture full-time between their first and second years uh, at Berkeley. So Hansu and I pursued Magoosh full-time between our first and second years, and we did it on our own. Um, we didn't have a stipend. We worked out of his basement. Um, you know, we just opted to do it. But we had classmates who were as excited about entrepreneurship as we were, but they just uh, weren't in the same personal situation where they could bypass a summer internship, so they needed to take a paying internship. 
And and Hansu always felt that that just wasn't right. You know, uh, Berkeley is a and the Silicon Valley area is a hub of entrepreneurial activity. People want to pursue these things, and the school should find a way to help people pursue entrepreneurial activities during that summer internship. Um, and he always said that you know when Magush is successful, we're gonna give back in this way. And so after his passing, we created a fellowship in his honor to do just that. So uh, we pick a startup team to work on their venture full time for the summer and give them a small stipend of uh, about five k, five to ten k, depending on the number of members of the team. So enough to cover rent and food, uh, and enable them to work full time on their startup. Um, and it's called uh, the Hansu Lee Fellowship, and you can read about it at uh, Hansu Lee Fellowship dot org. So tell me, where can people go for Magoosh, and also if they want to say thank you, and um, if they have a question for you or about GRE or whatever the case is. Yeah, uh, well, I mean, to learn more about Magoosh, you just go to our website, magoosh.com, M-A-G-O-O-S-H.com. But uh-huh. if they have a question for me, um, I, I try to, I, I, I may regret this, but they can email <laughs> me directly. Uh, at Bavin, uh, B-H-A-V-I-N, at Magush.com. I try to be as responsive as possible. And, you know, one of our core values uh, is communication is greater than efficiency. The idea being over-communicate, respond to your emails. Um, don't just try to be efficient and file things away just because you don't want to respond to them. And so I do try to respond to, to all my emails. That being said, sometimes the responses are really short, just saying, no, I'm sorry, I can't help. Um, but I will try. You are quick. This gets me into my, my last question, Pivin, which is going on your site, looking at your shirt, it makes me wonder why Magoosh? What, what does the name come from? Yeah, so I mentioned early on that uh, it wasn't just me and Hansu. There was uh, another founder, Pejman, and he's Persian. And so the name comes from an old Persian word that mean one, uh, means one who is wise, generous, and learned. So that really uh, epitomized what we wanted to do with Magoosh. We wanted to create an educational product that um, was making uh, education more accessible. Yeah. But Vin, thank you so much. This has been very powerful, and thank you for being so open with this really difficult situation. Yeah, thank you. Thank you for having me, and thank you for giving me the opportunity to share. Thanks, Pavin. Bye.